Okay, let's just um, uh, take a moment of silence to collect ourselves for a moment, center ourselves here um, for our our day to day and our our five weeks all together, five meetings all together, where we explore um, James Hillman and more deeply the the whole mm, depths of the psyche that he devoted his life to archetypal psychology. We don't have, and uh, we'll start. All right, welcome everybody. It's an honor to teach this course just after um, the, the person who is the key figure in, in the course uh, ended the, the great uh, life and life work that, that uh, comprised his journey. Uh, he died two months ago um, and he died at age 85. Um, same age I was thinking about this today that uh, that Jung was when when Jung died and in fact then I was thinking a little bit more as I was driving in how Jung was 50 when Hillman was born and uh, when Hillman died uh, we were uh, honoring the 50th anniversary of Jung's death um, it was just exactly you know, like a half century um, thing. So this is James Hillman and Archetypal Psychology and Introduction. Uh, I'm Rick Tarnas. And we're going to meet five weeks. This is the first. And it's a somewhat unusual schedule in that I built in two um, uh, off weeks so that you'd have two weeks to, to read uh, material rather than just one. So that it's, it's not that you're getting that big of, um, of a reading assignment with this class, particularly given the fact that it's a one unit class, uh, it's, it's not big compared with your three unit class reading type courses. But this is uh, n n nowhere near the kind of reading that you'd have to do in a lot of, lot of classes. But Hillman is, is rich. Uh, he's, there's a kind, even though he writes with extraordinary kind of, um, uh, craft and artistry. No word is ever in a sentence of Hillman's that hasn't been placed there with the same uh, care and kind of uh, intelligence for how it can be understood and received for the and for the music of it. Uh, in the same way that no note is put into a um, a symphony by you know Mozart or a, or a, a, a nocturne by Chopin, I mean it's very very thoughtful that way. But at the same time, it requires a lot of thoughtfulness to read. Um, you, I mean, some sentences of Hillman you can just you know be taking in at a at a fast clip. But a lot of sentences require a certain uh, care on the reader's part to to take in the multiple levels of what he's saying and the the illusions, the 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 the, the references, the uh, witty uh, neologisms, and so forth. So uh, I wanted you to have adequate time to to take in the the reading during in between our sessions because it's going to be important when we come together the four times after this see I'm not assuming you've read anything today no doubt a number of you have how many of you have some decent uh, encounter with James Hillman prior to today about about half okay so I'm not assuming anything uh, today but every time we meet from now on I will so uh, next week, here, let's look at the um, schedule that I gave you for the um, reading assignments. <clears throat> so next week, you'll, I'd like you to read Revisioning Psychology, uh, the introduction, or, uh, and, and part one, and then an essay he wrote called On Senex Consciousness. I'll say something about both those right now. Um, Revisioning psychology, uh, you want to have on your on your bookshelf. It's one of those books that 
you want to own and uh, and and read and perhaps reread and uh, almost all it's very likely that the edition that you're going to get will be the edition that <clears throat> it be, happened in 1992 17 years after its first edition and in that one uh, he everything's the same exactly except for he added a preface uh, on, on, and it specifically says a 1992 preface as I mentioned in the syllabus I, I personally uh, and, I, and I've talked to him about this and uh, he could he, he, he totally appreciated the um, the reasoning for this I personally would not read that 1992 preface that was added really just about you know 20 years later after the original work um, because it doesn't really uh, uh, introduce the book it more records a certain later moment where he's you know working out in, in a sense it's almost like he's having this kind of shadow fight with invisible antagonists that you can't quite see who they are uh, and they the level of writing and hmm, almost like the the rhetorical stance that he's taken in that that later preface is not at the kind of high renaissance level that the the original that the whole book is on and so it really does it it doesn't serve as a as a that great of an introduction I'd come back and read it later after you finish the book um, that book was was originally uh, written as it came out of four lectures that he gave at Yale in, um, in the early 70s and he those were the the Terry lectures which happened to be the the same lectures that uh, the series the same lecture series that Jung uh, gave at Yale when he came in the uh, like 1937 so there's a lineage there and Hillman completely rose to the occasion. I mean, this uh, revisioning psychology has a quality of, of, of thought, of language, of deep connection to the grand lineage of the Western cultural and imaginative tradition that uh, is... In, is it's it's his magnum opus in many ways, and uh, it's definitely the the manifesto of the archetypal psychology movement. But it also is a a great work of of literature and uh, part of if if we can think of uh, a canon in in a very kind of uh, flexible, multicultural, um, ever self revising way then this would definitely be part of a, a, a canon that I would admire. Um, so read for this next week, read Revisioning Psychology and the original introduction, which is also, uh, I think, subtitled In the Beginning, as I recall. And then um, part one, which is the first the original f first lecture that he gave at, at Yale. He's coming over at that point from Switzerland to give these lectures. He's he's been at that point he'd been out of America for the better part of 20 years, and so he's coming back to give this in the American academic setting. And then the, this other essay on Senex consciousness. Senex is the Latin word for old man or old person, and it's an archetype. It's basically it's a Saturn archetype. Uh, and this is a very, very uh, rich exploration of the Saturn archetype in the Western imaginative and spiritual religious literary tradition. And uh, I will post this on my CIS under this cor course's, uh, you know, what's, whatever it's called, you know, that in that portal, that that wonderful um, friendly portal that my CIS represents uh, and but anyway it's n I'll post it there so that you don't have to right now you you can you can either get it by going to a library 
uh, and getting the 1970 Spring Journal of Archetypal Psychology and Jungian Thought. It's, it, it was originally there that it was published in 1970 in the very first uh, issue of Spring that, um, as I recall, that, that Hillman edited. But then uh, it has more recently been published in Senex and Puer. The S, the, the uh, Puer is the Latin for boy or child, young, the youth archetype in a sense. So Senex and Puer is a volume that was recently published in a kind of collected works edition. So you could get it there too, but it, I'm trying to save you money for a one unit class. This is just, you just ha ha buy these two books revisioning psychology and then the other one is the thought of the heart and the soul of the world okay so for next week uh, just read those two um, revisioning psychology part one in the intro and on Senex consciousness anybody who doesn't have access to my CIS because uh, or at least to that particular portal because I those of you who are alumni that I uh, have invited to to be here if you if, as my guests write to, I'll give you an email address and uh, y we can send it to you. So write to R Tarnas, spelled just like my name, R Tarnas at Tarnas.org and then we'll, we'll uh, send you the, um, that, that essay in scanned form. All right, so then you have, after next week, you've got two weeks off. So don't come here on February 3rd and then two weeks off and during those two weeks, read parts two and three. Then two more weeks off, read part four. And then um, one week later, March 2nd, will be the last of our meetings, and that's Anima Mundi. And the, uh, in terms of the, the kind of modus operandi of the class, what we'll, what we'll do is, I mean, I'll be lecturing each class, and particularly today, I'll be lecturing uh, almost all of the class. But in subsequent classes, I want each of you to basically come to each class with at least one quotation. Just come with one quotation from his work. It could be a sentence, could be a paragraph, or maybe not a full paragraph because that takes a, a while. But just a sentence or a couple sentences, a, pa uh, a passage that really like in, that in provoked you or inspired you, somehow stimulated a response that you would be, uh, would like to share. We, uh, we won't get to everybody, um, but um, I want to be able to uh, interlace our, our time together with, with your responses uh, to the work and that is a kind of beginning of, of, of discussion in, in each case for, for that particular passage. So, uh, and that, the section that it comes from. So I thought I would, um, oh, in, in terms of the structure of each class, we'll, we'll go for an hour and, and a quarter or so, take a 15 minute break, and then do the second half of the class. So that's our, our usual um, structure. Now the way I've approached this class, teaching it, is uh, a, I, I wanted to basically give you a, a course that you wouldn't be able to get somewhere else. I, and so I want to draw on my own um, you know, knowledge of my, my long friendship with, with uh, James Hillman. Uh, I knew him for, for over 30 years as a, as a friend, as a, as a teacher, uh, as a, as a publisher, as an editor, uh, as a dialogue partner, as a debate partner. Um, uh, with, well, there's a lot of affection there. Um, and f I'm just thinking now, just before I mean, he was in, we kn he knew he was dying um, last summer and was in a hospice and I guess uh, his wife Margo and I were, I was just checking in how, how he was doing and Margo was writing me, uh, his wife, and he asked uh, who, who she was writing and she mentioned um, that it was me and that I was 
probably going, I had mentioned to her that I was probably going to teach this, this course um, this, this January. And um, he said, great. And he, was, and he gave some um, compliment and uh, about, I don't know, my, my, my n closeness to the material, my, my uh, he, he, it was, it was a, it was a lovely gesture of trust of uh, what I would do with it. And um, so I, I basically want to, in some ways, provide a kind of transmission of, of him in, in ways that you might not be able to get somewhere else. And one of the ways I want to do that is because, you know, I, I knew him for uh, personally and uh, for so long we would have him, I'd, I'd invite him to Esalen <coughs> uh, when I was director of programs there and from the, in the late 70s, early 80s. So, so from the early 80s he would come there. He'd never been to Esalen before that, uh, even though he would have been a natural and he became kind of a natural in some ways. Like Joseph Campbell, for example, was there a lot and Esalen was kind of his, very much his, one of his sanctuaries. And I think it became that uh, for James in a certain way later. But more Pacifica was his place in later years. And we, we co-taught courses together there, uh, or he'd guest lecture in my courses. And we were in a number of, um, uh, if you need to get um, a syllabi or anything, it's right there. And we did um, a number of conferences together and I also sat in on a number of his seminars like this actually a very similar number of people in the room and so one of the things I want to do today is kind of provide a things that he didn't write any, anywhere but served as a kind of could serve as I think a very helpful personal introduction to entering into his work and into archetypal psychology generally. I'd like to do that with you today. Um, <clears throat> and I also, I know a good number of you are initiated into the archetypal astrological perspective, which, which Hillman definitely was, and astrology played a, a, uh, a continuing role in kind of fertilizing his archetypal imagination and informing his archetypal eye, as he put it. And so later in the, after we've, you know, got, gotten through a decent amount of his writing later in the, in the course, I'll spend a little time with his birth chart with you. We'll just, I'll just make copies uh, for you and, and we'll spend, a, we won't, it won't be uh, totally focused on it, but I want to just, uh, it, it would be ridiculous not to, um, not to discuss it because it, it was such a s significant part of his way of seeing things in a certain way and also, but uh, often in a kind of so sotto voce way, like kind of implicit, kind of quiet or, but you'll see it when you read um, on Senex consciousness. You could not have written that essay unless you were deeply uh, in direct contact with, with the archetype of Saturn in every way, the ast astrological tradition, the alchemical tradition, the, the iconic uh, mythological traditions. Let me begin uh, with the, the tribute uh, that I wrote um, on the morning that he died, which was la uh, October 27, and Margot, uh, Margot McLean was his his wife during the last 20 years, wonderful woman and uh, an artist. And she uh, sent e emails to a number of us, the, an, an email the morning that he died. We are aware from two or three days before that he was in his last moments. <clears throat> James Hillman, one of our great mentors, died this morning at his home in Connecticut. I wrote this for the PCC chat, that's why it says one of our great mentors. Died this morning at his home in Connecticut. He was 85. His wife Margot said he was true to his character to the end, even as he moved into that place between day and night, speaking through the night in many languages, very funny, and himself. 
during these last several months despite the pain and the medications needed to manage it. He had a kind of pelvic, he had pelvic uh, bone cancer. James had managed to finish the many projects he'd been intensely committed to completing before he left. What a good feeling that must be to have finished the things that you really wanted to finish before you die. That's got to be one of the great blessings of life, especially at age 85. Um, may I just add, in tribute to him as a friend, how deeply James enriched us with his unending flow of insights, placing so many things in new light and in shadow. His depth of soul and reading and culture, his trickster wit, his heretic originality, his sharp-edged individuality, he will be deeply missed, but he left us with so much that, he, that we will be integrating for a long time to come. It was just over 30 years ago that he came to San Francisco and presented to the American Academy of Psychoanalysis a lecture that would later become his profound and influential essay, Anima Mundi, The Return of the Soul to the World, a turning point in depth psychology. And I then quote from that uh, essay. Ecology movements, futurism, feminism, urbanism, protest and disarmament, personal individuation, cannot alone save the world from the catastrophe inherent in our very idea of the world. They require a cosmological vision that saves the phenomenon world itself. They require a move in soul that goes beyond measures of expediency to the archetypal source of our world's continuing peril, the fateful neglect, the repression of the anima mundi, the world soul, the soul of the world, anima mundi. May he rest in peace and live on here through us as he would have wished. Um, by the way, notice there's two terms that come up over and over again when, when you read Hillman when, when we speak of him, when, and one of them is soul. It was Hillman that brought the word soul into widespread use in psychology. Um, and that began in 1964 with his essay, uh, Suicide and the Soul, actually his, his book called Suicide and the Soul. Um, he insisted on soul being at the heart of any psychology that was worth its, that was true to its name. Because psychology means the logos of the psyche, right? The, 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 the meaning of the psyche, the narrative of the psyche, the, the, the study of the psyche. And psyche means, which is Greek, psuche, means uh, it's anima in Latin, soul in English. And uh, in fact, Hillman's got a great line let me see if I uh, can um, pull it up quickly. You'll see it in the, in the opening of the, um, the, pre the introduction to the introduction to revisioning psychology. Um, what he says is, let me just see if it Oh yeah, I do have it here. Good. Where there is a connection to soul, there is psychology. Where not, what is taking place is better called statistics, physical anthropology, cultural journalism, or animal breeding. See, I mean, he basically covers all the academic, the typical academic approaches to psychology. You know, statistical, quantitative, um, studies of psychology or of, of the of human experience, uh, behaviorism. You know, B. F. Skinner with his pigeons and animal breeding is his. Little, that's that's a typical Hillman um, witty cut. You know, uh, and it's it's Hillman that brings in soul in that sense, and it's also Hillman that brings in anima mundi. We now say anima mundi all the time. That was Hillman that brought in Anima Mundi. And, um, 
and actually, and it was that was the day I met him actually for the first time as we I was introduced to him by a, a common friend, Stan Groff, and I had driven up together from um, Esalen to the American Academy. We, we both lived there in Big Sur in those years. This is uh, 1980. And the American Academy of Psychoanalysis is, is that, uh, at least was, that uh, association of psychoanalysts in the United States that was more, more liberal, less doctrinaire, less dogmatic, less kind of medically reductionist, et cetera. It's more, more adventurous. And at this particular remarkable gathering, um, Groff was speaking, Hillman was speaking, also uh, Rollo May was there too. So um, I, I drove up with Stan and a um, um, friend of mine and of Hillman's named Gordon Tappan, who was the, the one of the key figures in depth psychology up at Sonoma uh, in, introduced, brought, brought us to lunch together. We had the three of us eating lunch together. In fact, I remember, it's just coming back now. Um, you know how conferences have that little, um, you know, you, a little name tag where it says like Rick Tarnas and what, where you're from? And mine instead had been mistyped, it said Rick Tarnas, but then instead of saying Big Sir, it said Bug Sir. And Hillman said, Joyce would have loved that, um, uh, James Joyce. He, and, and Hillman loved, I mean, he wrote a whole essay, he all wrote a whole essay on bugs, and, and he loved um, the, the trickster. He was a trickster with words, and he loved the way words, language, Hermes was a trickster all the time. Um, he pointed out once how, he said, you know how you can, uh, sometimes you go to a dictionary to look up a word, and you come out about 45 minutes later because there's so many interesting things that you've been following along. Let's, well, he said, but then another time, you'll be looking through a book for where there was a particular sentence that you want to quote, and you remember exactly you know, where it was on the page and roughly where it was in the book, and you look, and you can't find it, and you never find it. <laughs> and it says, and that's, the, that's the trickster Hermes logos, the word, veiling itself, concealing itself, and then popping out when you're not expecting, et cetera. Or, or when, it, especially as you get older, where words, you know, they're on the tip of your tongue, but you can't quite get what that word was, that name, et cetera, and then, and then you let it go, and then it's there. Um, that's, he, he was very devoted to uh, language in that way. So that was the, um, that was when he came here in, uh, in, in 1980, and um, Stan, and I think it's worthwhile saying something about Stan Groff in relationship to Hillman. Uh, they, they, were not, uh, they, they were not closely connected, I mean, I mean they're mainly connected through me, uh, and, um, and yet there's a certain remarkable parallel. They, uh, I th I, many people consider them to be the two most um, profound and creative psychologists of their generation, and, and I certainly um, believe that uh, to be true. They both founded uh, or co-founded uh, cl collaboratively uh, major schools in depth psychology, archetypal psychology in the case of, of uh, Hillman, and uh, transpersonal psychology in the case of Groff, and both of them, and What's remarkable is, I mean, they're born within five years of each other, and then and they both have their, basically their kind of psychological and intellectual awakening, create a breakthrough in the 1960s. And then in 1968-69, uh, they, they begin, is when this, they initiate their new, the new impulse, the, the new schools. Uh, when we say school, not like they didn't have uh, a school, building and particular faculty or anything like that. The, these were like uh, communities of uh, um, uh, thinkers, psychologists, writers, um, uh, artists, healers that uh, had a kinship of, of spirit and that uh, collaborated throughout the world. 
it was it was in the actually under the triple conjunction there 68 69 when so many uh, huge creative breakthroughs happen uh, uh, Jupiter Uranus Pluto triple conjunction that and uh, both archetypal psychology and transpersonal psychology began and then they both uh, published their master uh, their initial master works that kind of established their um, perspective in 1975 under the uh, at the same time, um, revisioning psychology in the case of Hillman, realms of the human unconscious in the case of, of uh, Groff, and then from then on, the two uh, their their work progressed. And I think we could say that um, I mean it's while they are th I believe the most uh, significant psychologists of their generation. Uh, uh, each is so in a totally different way. I mean, Hillman is ceaselessly creative, critical. He's subtle. Um, he's a he's a, a creative trickster with ideas as well as language. He's passionate. He's politically engaged. He's eloquent. He's a great stylist. Um, he's skeptical of salvation. Yet he's a kind of doctor of the, of the church, of, of soul, um, in a deeper way. He's able to see the gods and the patterns of the gods in, in uh, culture in a way that is similar to uh, the way Nietzsche could or, or, or Ficino. Um, and he's coming out of the Western tradition uh, from Plato, even going back to pre-Socratic, uh, Heraclitus in particular, but Plato, Plotinus are huge, um, going right up to the Renaissance, uh, Platonic Academy, and F Marsilio Ficino was a huge model for him, going right up through uh, the Romantics, Keats, Coleridge, um, Vico before that, and then uh, Freud and Jung. And well, um, Stan Groff is completely, uh, he's, he's much more, brings a much more kind of global mystical revelation through his depth psychology. Um, he's like Jung in that sense, uh, but he's more, stands much more multicultural uh, even than Jung. And um, also he's got this, he's mediating this kind of titanic spiritual somatic uh, breakthrough uh, to, a, to a, a new universe, like in a kind of impossibly rich and glorious universe that's of the divine uh, creativity, Leela, the divine play. Um, and so Stan brings also, there's certain ways in which Hillman was not that clinical. He was not that focused on psychotherapy per se. In fact, the essence of archetypal psychology at one level is he wanted to bring uh, archetype, he wanted to bring depth psychology out of the out of the consulting room and into the world, into culture. He wanted to have a therapy of ideas and uh, not just a therapy of individuals. That's essential to um, to Hillman. And when Hillman um, I mean, there was even a, there was a kind of disillusionment or disenchantment with psychotherapy in certain respects in Hillman. And, uh, and that one book that he co-wrote with Michael Ventura called We've Had a Hundred Years of Psychotherapy and the World is Getting Worse um, gets, cuts to the heart of it. And you can see with that title, um, part of the issue is that the kind of psychotherapy that Hillman was critiquing was not in itself um, didn't have the kind of power that could facilitate profound psycho spiritual somatic transformations it was there more it was more of a kind of interpretive psych uh, talking therapy uh, and by contrast Stan uh, Groff is bringing this um, immensely powerful set of therapeutic uh, modalities uh, involving uh, psychedelic 
plants, uh, LSD, sacred medicines, um, uh, breath work, uh, experiential forms of psychotherapy involving also you know, powerful music, somatic uh, interventions and so forth, much more risky, uh, much more, um, more transformative, more revelatory, more dramatic. Um, and also uh, Stan has more, he's got more system, more, um, he's, he's more uh, interested in, in getting a kind of overarching paradigm that brings everything into uh, coherence. That was not at all Hillman's, Hillman was a postmodern subverter. Uh, he, uh, well, Graf was a kind of um, building a, a map of the psyche and a mode of psychotherapy that could serve an opening to a, a, a new paradigm, a new cosmos that was coherent with the with uh, breakthroughs in, in uh, new paradigm sciences and, uh, and that was coherent with indigenous uh, uh, shamanic traditions and rites of passage and uh, ancient mystery religions and so forth. Hillman was much more coming out of the Western um, intellectual, cultural imagination, and and he 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 remained more uh, rooted to it, and always got, like going back to Greece, for example, was very crucial and Greek myth. Um, both both of them. Um, oh, well, one other thing about Groff is that Groff stand. Is not doesn't have the linguistic um, I mean, English is Stan's third language at best, and so he's he's writing um, in in a way that while well, Hillman writes in English with that n kind of nuanced control uh, where, of irony and multiple uh, levels of meaning in in different words, where you can when you when you are, are that at home with the idiom of a, of your mother tongue, you can really uh, be playing tennis at a very high level kind of. But while Stan's writing more, he just wants to be understood getting the cl a, a, a clear um, articulation of pretty complicated uh, experiences and, and phenomena. But there's nothing in him that's moving towards uh, stylistic um, brilliance. While Hillman is an artist, right to the right to the core, and that's, that's a big difference as well. I think um, you could also say, um, bottom line, I, I'm, I'm, I'm making this comparison, by the way, partly because uh, Stan Groff is, is so uh, connected to this school and has sh shaped many of our uh, lives and thought and, and is Transpersonal psychology plays a huge role at CIS. Well, Hillman is more connected to, um, among graduate schools, to Pacifica and to that kind of, um, where the, the focus is much more on the, the archetypal, mythic, Jungian, depth psychology tradition, which is dear to, to the CIS world um, uh, and to PCC in particular, but it is not, um, it's, there. CIS has always had an allegiance to the East um, and an East-West dialogue that is central to Gross work that is not particularly central to, to Hillman's work. Um, so, the, so one of the reasons I'm doing this comparison is by way of I mean, these kind of parallel um, geniuses of the psyche. Uh, in a way, it's kind of like if we're in, if we're looking at film history, it's like doing a, a kind of comparative portrait of Bergman and Fellini. You know, um, sorry, and you and uh, you could Im you could imagine uh, which one's Fellini, um, uh, or you know, it's a, or like the, like the um, the Beatles and the Stones, or or like uh, Len Lennon and McCartney with with like. Hillman's John Lennon more, and, and, and Groff is more Paul McCartney, you know, um, that sort of world-embracing uh, spiritual uh, optimism, and McCartney, and, and uh, well, Hillman's more the 
you know, kind of politically engaged, pissed off, skeptical, more salt, you know, more um, coming in with that, that edge. Um, but I think just generally speaking, see, Stan is a mystic and a, and a shaman um, and, and a healer. And he's a builder of a cartography of the psyche and a, and a powerful method of, of psychological transformation and spiritual transformation. In fact, spirit is so central to, to Stan, while spirit is almost a uh, taboo um, or a, a, an antagonist for Hillman um, compared with soul. And we'll be seeing a lot of that. And Stan also comes from medicine as a physician and, and from science and, um, and then moves towards uh, Eastern mysticism while Hillman is coming from the humanities and literature and, and uh, is embedded more in the cultural imagination. Hillman is not a great mystic. He's, he's a great poet um, and also a firebrand rebel. Uh, champion of soul and so that gives you a little sense for the these two very different um, and yet uh, I think complementary uh, um, seminal figures in in the 20th century depth psychology and and they are the two as many people have said individually about them um, if you you look at Freud and Jung I mean, the, these two giants. And then um, Groff is the, the psychologist of the next generation who is at that level of you know, magnitude in terms of the ways I've been describing. But there's another way in which Hillman is also uh, in that lineage and, and at that level of having a, a great influence on culture and being a kind of public intellectual and um, in a sense, being very much a, I was thinking about this on the way here, how Hillman is, was something like um, a, he was a rebel against Jung and at the same time a continuer of Jung's uh, lineage. And, uh, and, that's, and the rebellion against him, especially in the later years, took much more of the form of pulling out that part of Jung that he was most allied with and, and imagining it forward uh, and critiquing it, uh, critiquing the world with its means uh, in a very um, creative way. And in that sense, he was just, he was like a true, a true um, son of Jung. And I was thinking about how Jung would be, it's a kind of relationship where you would be as a father proud of such a son even where how much he diverged uh, but he was himself you know and in, so, in some sense it, it, the son became proud of the father I noticed in the later years the last decade uh, 15 years that Hillman did a couple of marvelous seminars which I'll share the uh, highlights with you uh, from on uh, one was called In Defense of Jung, just a brilliant seminar. Uh, and um, he, he really was able to, uh, you could see, uh, assimilate uh, deeply what Jung had to, had to give us in, in, a, in, a, in a new way. <clears throat> so uh, let me um, say a little bit now about Hillman's biography. So James was born in 1926 in Atlantic City in a hotel, as he liked to say. His father uh, was in the hotel business. And um, he grew up in the, in the 1930s and early 40s. It's quite, quite precocious uh, reading the lines you could say like even in high school he started going over to Georgetown um, uh, the the Jesuit University to take classes he was just like right at the he, he's already moving towards Europe because the Jesuits are a kind of um, uh, channel of Europe into the US in education so he, he and then 19 um, late teens early 20s he's he joins the Navy this is at the end towards the end of World War II 
the hospital corps. He does, I think, he does some writing uh, journalism within the uh, on for the navy, and then he basically stays in Europe, and he doesn't come back for for decades. I mean, really, for for more than more than 30 years, like. When he finally came back, oh, we'll talk about this uh, later in the course, he said it was like a kind of revelation to, uh, he didn't move back here fully until 1978, and first to Dallas and then to Connecticut, University of Dallas, gave him this first position back here in the U.S. And um, he said like the whole, the whole 60s revolution that kind of was centered in the U.S. Uh, in, in many ways, he, that, that, that just wasn't part of his world. There was just like a huge transformation, uh, social transformation, cultural, uh, that he kind of had to rapidly catch up with. But in the meantime, while he was there in Europe, uh, in Zurich, you know, uh, well, it was first in Dublin, then in Paris, and then in, in, in Zurich. Uh, he, he, uh, in Switzerland, there was like this cloistered, this womb of... Um, intellectual and, and psychological deep I mean it's like he was protected in some sense from the from the throes of the uh, of the storms that were happening in in the rest of the world but he was observing it actually it reminds me of the way Jung was during um, the world wars living in Switzerland being in a neutral country um, he was witnessing, it was very close, like just m a few miles away, the bombs are happening, the Nazis are there, the, the, um, the horrors are there. Uh, and at the same time, Jung being in Switzerland and Hillman later being in Switzerland during a period of cultural and political ferment throughout the world, he was in some sense uh, in this kind of... Um, uh, observer's place that at the same time you're participating in the zeitgeist. You can't escape it. Any of us here could go off into a, a cabin um, for the next five years as a hermit and not talk to anybody, get off the internet, etc. But I guarantee you that you would experience the, the uh, powerful energies of transformation that the world is going to be going through, uh, already is, has been, and is going to continue for, uh, for years to come. We all participate in that anima mundi, in that zeitgeist, that spirit of the time. It's, it's informing our soul, no matter if you're in the most secluded, uh, isolated, meditative um, cave you can imagine, it's going to be inside you. But it will take a different form than if you're in the interplay of um, um, on the streets, uh, having the music, the, uh, the drugs, the, the social uh, atmosphere pervading you in a much more potentially kind of intrusive and influential way. <clears throat> so he goes to so he, he, he first gets a degree in, in Dublin, studies, he studies Platonism there, um, but mainly he said his emotional life was largely outside of, the, outside of the university and he was very deeply connected to the literary world of Dublin and the, that, you know, the James Joyce world, the, the world of eloquence and, and soul that is part of the Irish psyche. That, that was quite influential. While inside the classes, um, he would have to take courses like, uh, that he wasn't particularly into. He said at one point, uh, he was taking an ethics class that he was, com and around, you know, s s several weeks into the class, the professor looked over and said, take the odd note, Hillman. I just thought that was the greatest line. Take the odd note, Hillman. <laughs> um, and, uh, that, and, and then he went to Paris from uh, 1947 to 49. So 
so he's still in his early 20s. And Paris, he said existentialism was just pervading the Parisian scene then. And said, you, you know, you, you had to dress in black. And, um, which, and, and it was a, uh, an, an era in which the existentialist impulse to see through, to deconstruct, to skeptically, um, uh, that hermeneutics of suspicion that is, uh, comes out of the existentialist um, frame of mind was, was very strong there. And he said, and there's a cynical dimension to it, but that impulse towards seeing through um, is very much part of revisioning psychology and archetypal psychology generally. Except with Hillman, it takes this, a spin so that you are seeing through to the archetype. You're seeing through to the mythic level. Um, and you're seeing through your fantasy. You're, see, you're seeing through what you think is the fact that you're objectively perceiving and recognizing that there's an archetypal fantasy that's shaping your vision. So you see how that, that, that deconstructive seeing through move is then being placed in the service of the archetypal um, uh, enrichment of, of consciousness. And then he goes to, and then he goes to uh, Zurich, and it's 1953, and he <clears throat> joins the the. He said the the Jung Institute then at that point was pretty, uh, still in its in its early years. I mean the the psychology the, the psychological club that. Uh, y y Jung had founded back in the 19 teens, like 1916, if I re recall correctly. That had been a, a, a very vital um, community uh, for decades. But finally, a, kind of a, a real Jungian institute was founded in uh, the late 40s. Uh, and that became, um, that was still in, in its earlier, early years in the, in the early 50s when, when Hillman got there. And he said, these were not people who came to uh, become analysts, they, to become therapists. These were people who were a mess, like himself. And he's very candid, he just said, you know, he said, I, w I was a neurotic mess when I, uh, uh, when I got there. And um, we all were. And we came there to sort, you know, basically get a center and uh, orientation and a stabilization and to understand this psychopathological um, uh, ferment that they were, they were dealing with. He actually sat in, uh, he, he actually did uh, psychotherapy with Jung himself as an analyst for a short time and then decided against it with him and went to a different uh, analyst. He, he uh, told me later that um, Jung was so powerful a presence. He was so big. Uh, Hillman, Hillman is, was a, a smaller man, um, you know, more my size, I'd say, uh, weight and height, roughly. While, while Jung was, you know, over six feet and powerful. And, you know, when, when Jung talks about, even in his 80s, talking about as a young boy, um, some bully was bothering him and he just, he hit him and knocked him right down and uh, uh, knocked him out. Uh, that you, Jung was po a very powerful person and, and formidable, imposing. And... But it wasn't the physicality so much, obviously. I mean, there, there, although he remembers that when they're sitting, when you were sitting with Jung in analysis, you sat chair to chair, seat, looking at each other. Very different than Freud lying on the couch, eyes closed, no, no, you know, kind of contact uh, uh, visually or um, uh, even in some sense it shifts the whole affective field in the Freudian context. While in the Jungian context, you're looking right at each other, and uh, you're sitting knees, knee to knee, as, uh, or knees to knees, as, as Hillman put it. And he remembers particularly how, how, large, uh, how large Jung's um, 
shoes were. Uh, and, um, but the, the, the deeper point is that he felt that Jung's psychological and intellectual presence was so um, imposing that it would have burned him up, Jung, uh, uh, Hillman, that it would have been the, the son the uh, young son was so radiantly powerful that it would have singed and burned um, Hillman, and he needed to get a, a. He found it more helpful to to see another analyst. But he, in the course of the fifth by 1959, he became uh, the director of studies at the Young Institute, which was a new a new position. He. he he actually um, kind of conceived of. And then he, uh, all during from 59 to 69, he had that position and he was the one that would be, you know, inviting the people who, who would be speaking, uh, uh, Eliada or um, Sholem or, or R.D. Lang or Alan Watts or whatever. Uh, and he, um, and that's when he started to, his ability, he started to write, I think his first book was called Emotion, just on, you know, on the topic of emotion, and then Suicide in the Soul, 1964. Emotion was 1960. Uh, and then the, the breakthrough happens. You can see it in that first, he, he's invited to Eranos. How many of you know about Eranos? Uh, <coughs> Eranos is the place and the community, community in the sense of, peop of scholars who would come together once a year for about 10 days in the summer to uh, Lago Maggiore, uh, to this villa that um, a woman named Olga Kaptein, uh, Olga Frobe Kaptein, um, starting in the 1930s, she hosted these, and then from about 33 on, she and Jung became, she, uh, together they kind of organized, Jung being more the person who decided who would be invited, and often shaping the, the topic. And these were scholars who were uh, the, the most remark remarkable scholars of religion, philosophy, uh, Psychology, East West, um, Neumann and uh, Eliada and uh, Joseph Campbell in later years, but in the earlier years it was people like, um, well, R Rudolf Otto was actually uh, involved at the very beginning, the, the person who came up with the term uh, the numinous. Um, the, he wrote the book The Idea of the Sacred, very influential book in, in the history of, of uh, in the, in the psychology and philosophy of religion. And, um, but others were, uh, everyone from Heinrich Zimmer to D.T. Suzuki, um, and um, so many remarkable scholars over the years, Martin Buber, Paul Tillich, etc. And starting in uh, about 1966 or seven, Hillman began, was invited to go there to join them, and by that point, um, uh, Jung had died in 1961. He gave his last, Jung, by the way, gave his last, you see, once a year they'd get together for these 10 days, and they would give, like, one paper each. And Jung's paper, the last one that he gave uh, at Eranos, was 1951 on synchronicity. That's, that's where he first introduced uh, a, a full exposition of the idea of synchronicity. And that was the last one there. For, there were three years here in 2000, what was it, like 2006 to eight or seven to nine, uh, that I became involved with Eranos and was helping to organize like who, the, the conferences and gave a number of, of talks there, uh, including um, material that I'll actually share with you here. Uh, because the, the, the last time we did it, we, now Aranos is, for, 
for various reasons, including financial. Uh, it, it's having to go into hibernation again. But on the, the last time that I was there, we went, we had the Aronos Legacy Tour, went through Zurich and uh, Aronos there on Lago Maggiore, which is in the Italian part of Switzerland. You know, the, the way that the PCC uh, community goes down once a year from here down to Big Sur and kind of makes that trip through the, the Highway 1 and the cliffs and et cetera. Well, uh, it takes several hours of driving and then moving into this sort of totally different space right by the water. Well, that's just what it was like where the, where the Jungian community once a year would travel over the mountains from Zurich, over the Alps, and down into the Italian part of Switzerland. Totally different vibration there. Uh, to uh, Casa Aranos, Casa Gabriella, these two villas right on, on Lago Maggiore, which is on the Italian-Swiss border. And, and, and during those 10 days, they would, they would just kind of, they would go into this kind of other space and they would share their best work. Uh, many, and, oh, and by the way, the people that were there were not generally like Jungians. They were scholars of, Jung was sort of like first amongst equals there, but they, these were people who were the, the, the leaders in their particular fields. But at Aranos, they spoke about what they couldn't speak about in their home school, in their, in their more uh, constricted uh, discipline. There they could be multidisciplinary and they could be engaged with um, the, the spiritual dimension of the experiences that they were writing about rather than um, to, uh, they, they, could, they could be more candid, as it were, with, with each other and come from a deeper place. So Hillman um, pretty quickly rose to the top of, I, I've talked to um, the, the woman who is still there now as a kind of housekeeper, wonderful woman, um, told me that it was pretty apparent there even in the late 60s, early 70s, that James was the was the new star, that he, he was just, I had a level of intelligence and breadth of erudition and uh, creativity that outshone the, the whole um, first generation of, of Jungians. And, and Hillman was a, uh, was a warrior and a provocateur and he made enemies and, and there was a lot of um, um, difficulties, like, particularly like between him and the, the first generation of Jungians that were more carrying the established tradition of Jung from uh, particularly von Franz and Edinger. Um, Hellman was so unlike them and he wanted to bring about much more of a kind of really a kind of postmodern reconstructing of the Jungian legacy while they wanted to stay much more true to the what Hillman would regard as the church of Jung which he didn't want to do. Um, one way of putting uh, one way of putting it that Hillman does uh, in revisioning psychology is he says I follow Jung on his, in his psychology but not in his theology. Now, Jung would say, I'm not a theologian, I'm a psychologist, I'm a scientist, I'm, a, I'm an empiricist, I'm, I'm a therapist, I'm a healer, a physician. I am uh, not talking about metaphysics and theology and about what is in a kind of objective way at a, at a metaphysical, spiritual, metaf um, theological level. But Hillman, Hillman's point, as we will see uh, all through our, this, this course, was that there is running through Jung a certain profound Christian religiosity uh, and, a, 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 and a spiritual metaphysics and a theology that's in, encoded in the, in the whole psychology of the self, self with a capital S, self as the God image, the self that, that brings everything together in individuation. Um, Hillman was always committed to the many over the one. The one was the enemy for him. Like the, the, the monotheistic, um, the monotheistic ego, the monotheistic um, scientific tradition, the monotheistic spiritual tradition. These were the, these were the problem, and he wanted to 
engage the multiplicity of the psyche, the many gods, the polytheism of the psyche rather than its monotheism, the Cartesian, Judaic, Christian monotheism. That was, he felt, a, a, uh, an oppressive uh, system that he needed to oppose. And he sometimes would make the, just the uh, kind of manifesto reference that you, we should move we, psychology needs to go south. It needs to go over the Alps from the northern Protestant uh, scientific, spiritual ref, uh, reformation, spirit, geist oriented um, kind of cold, rational, um, moving towards unit of transcendence kind of psychology and move towards the rich, sensuous uh, soul of the Mediterranean uh, world of, of the, the multiple gods and goddesses and of, of, of soul that the Greco-Roman uh, ancients carried. So that's, that's a big theme that we'll see a lot of. Okay, let's take um, a 15-minute break, and uh, when we come back, we'll continue.